Thanks for being on the show. Thanks wow. for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited to hear your story today. I think others are excited to hear it as well. It's, it's a crazy one. Yeah, I want to... Well, what got you into archery? What, what was... There's so many things that I remember happened to me during that time, but uh, 2010, stay-at-home dad. And I don't know if you remember in 2010, but the economy was really bad. Yeah. Uh, and I couldn't get a job to save my life. Like, nobody would hire me. Uh, even if I qualified, you know, they're like, you have no arms, you know, that kind of stuff. So I, I was sitting on the couch trying to figure out how I was going to put food on the table. And this guy comes on TV and he's out in the woods with his bow. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure I could do that. So the next day I went up, I got a bow and uh, started teaching myself how to shoot for the sole purpose of literally just putting food on the table. I had no idea at that point that life would take me. <laughs> where it took me that's incredible i mean you pick up a bow there's no there wasn't any model for you was there no i actually googled how to how to teach an armless man how to shoot a bow <laughs> uh nothing <laughs> things popped up but nothing uh, nothing with that and you could google it now and of course there's you know there's a video of me shooting and stuff like that um in fact a side note story um I will go to a different state and like an archery shop or something and I'll go in there. Uh, for example, I was in Atlanta and I go in there to shoot some guns and as I'm waiting for them, he has my license and everything and as I'm waiting to check out after I was done shooting, I said, hey, do you have the new whatever bow in stock? And he goes, uh, yeah, I think we do or whatever. He's like, do you, he goes, he asked me, do you shoot a bow? I'm like, well, I was thinking about getting into it, but I have no arms. And he's like, oh my goodness, there's this guy on Facebook. And he like brought up a picture of me and showed me. He's like, look at this guy. He's awesome. I'm like, and he never, he didn't even understand it was me the entire time. I even left there without telling him that that was me. Unbelievable. It was like, <laughs> like I didn't even know how to act. Like, I thought it was so cool that he didn't even, and he was so willing to help me get into archery that he showed videos of myself to me. <laughs> that's so funny it's like imagine being uh tom cruise and someone comes up to you you look just like tom cruise that's i'm sure he gets crazy. it all the time i'm sure he does yeah wow so for our listeners you competed in the 2012 uh paralympics mm. where was that london london yeah that was, that was a good year took mm. home silver, silver. medal mm -hmm. that's fantastic and that was your first time competing correct yeah. well or first international competition yeah i had only started shooting competitions probably a year before that and then again in 2016 where was that one yeah that was in rio de janeiro yeah. how did that one differ from 2012 in in your eyes uh in 2012 i was just coming onto the scene i had no expectations going into it i was just there for rio i trained for four years for that specific moment and then i lost in the second round because I had an equipment malfunction. And so that affected me a lot differently than in 2012 because in 2012, I actually lost my last match because if you win, you get a gold. But I was still happy because I won something. And yeah. in, in Rio, not so much because it kind of it's kind of like a, you're leading the race with a lap to go and your tire blows and you ended up getting last. I mean, that's kind of the same, you know, out of your control there's nothing you can do about it so that that burns a little bit of course yeah well it's like if you're an olympic swimmer and you lose by like mm. point mm -hmm. you know of a millisecond yeah it's kind of yeah. like that it sounds like yeah i i heard a story uh from a guy uh, michael johnson he uh olympic runner i don't know if you remember him for a long time like i don't he, think i know him but... usain bolt broke all his records so before usain bolt there was michael johnson he was the fastest man on the planet for, you know, 15 years or whatever. And he tells a story about uh, the 1% where, let's say you're in a, a runner and you wake up that morning and you do your hair up and all that stuff and you lose and you get fourth, so you don't actually get to go to the games, but you lose by .01, which means that morning when if you woke up, if you would have just made your hair go forward a little bit, it would have crossed the line that much faster. Then you actually would have been going to the games based on how you did your hair that day it's like competing at the highest <laughs> level is insane I know. Like, I know. it really is like razor thin it's it is. like mm -hmm. yeah so how do you prepare for, prepare for that mentally what's going on i find myself the best way to prepare for it is to not 
overthink it. So yeah. on tournaments that I prepare for like crazy, and then I go into it and I don't do as well, like I feel like mentally, like I had I put too much pressure on myself to perform because I put all that time in training. Mm. What I learned after Rio, I still train just as hard as I would before, but I don't in my mind say now I'm gonna I'm gonna go into this tournament and put all that pressure of all that training for that specific moment. I'm training because I love to do it and I want to be better. So if I just think of a tournament, a tournament, and I'm not wasting five years of my time on this one tournament, then you do better because you don't have that all that extra pressure. Yeah. It's almost like, uh, you know, losing sight of the forest for the tree mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah, for sure. Um, maybe that's the only way that you can train. If you don't love to train, you, you know, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a real uphill battle. That's I think. true. That's true. I have, there's times though, this is, this is weird. Uh, two years ago in Vegas, which is the, the largest paying tournament in the world. Okay. So if what, you win, what are like the purse purses for that? over a hundred thousand? Okay. Wow. For first place. Wow. Yeah. I remember I was, I put a lot of thought into that tournament and I missed one point. So a 900 is a perfect score and I shot an 899. So wow. I, I did really well, <laughs> but I wasn't like super happy with how I shot. So I literally, when I got home, I didn't touch my bow for a month. Got my bow out the very next, like I shot, I shot it for like 10 minutes, packed it back up, flew to a tournament and then won the whole thing. And I was like, okay, <laughs> but, and it wasn't because I wasn't not practicing, but I spent that month mental practicing now. Yeah. My physical part was there. I knew I could do it. And I knew that it was the mental side that let me down in Vegas. So that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, I've had that experience several times, creative editing a video or something, mm -hmm. and it's, it's really intense mental strain, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, like, you know, if you're trying to make a five minute video and then suddenly you know, it takes you like 50 hours or whatever mm -hmm. it is. If you can just walk away for a week yeah. and come back, you'd be surprised at how much easier it becomes. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. So yeah. Letting... It's good to have a reset. Yeah. Resets mm -hmm. are good. Mm -hmm. So you have 2020 Paralympics coming up. What, what are you doing for that? So this year was supposed to be an amazing year. Um, but it's now 2021 Paralympics because of everything that's happened in the world. Everything got canceled and pushed off a year. That's wild. Is it still going to be hosted in the same place? or Yeah, every, everything will be exactly the same. Uh, just everything's been pushed off a year. So I was bummed about it as far as uh, income was concerned because this was supposed to be a good year for me. When that happened, I lost a lot of uh, income. But what it does is it gives me a whole other year to train. <laughs> so that means I can be even better next year. Yeah. And so what kind of bows are you working with? Because I, I, I just don't know much about bows, to be honest. But Yeah, so uh, one of the things that I kind of pride myself in in my, in my life is that I don't have a lot of adaptations in my life. Mm. So, for example, the bow is a completely normal bow that you with arms could shoot. You just walk into a store and any bow on the shelf I can shoot. I, I don't want it special made for me. I don't want it different. I want it the same. So that way, when I win... They can't be like, oh, there's an unfair can't advantage there. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's incredibly, that's very commendable. That's awesome. Thanks. It's funny. My first exposure to you, I'll just share the story briefly, but I was walking to the public library and you rolled up in this purple hot rod car <laughs> and it was blasting music, presumably your, your wife. Mm -hmm. um, you guys were laughing, having an amazing time. And my, my back was turned to you. So I thought... This sounds like, uh, this is probably a kid, some punk kid. And when I turned, your foot was on the steering wheel. I was like, my mind was blown. I'm like, this guy is loving life. And then I, and then I got to hear about your story and I watched some YouTube videos and, and that was awesome. It's like, I feel like I'm, I'm talking to a celebrity right now. Fairfield's own. <laughs> you know, I, I got into archery not to be a celebrity. I got into it because yeah. I wanted to provide for my family. A lot of people say I'm I'm famous. I am not famous. I I'm just this is me. I'm just living my life and I mean I don't I'd be living it this way whether I was what everybody thinks is famous, you know, I just I don't look at it that way. So when my son's like, Dad, you're famous. I'm like, yeah, that's such a weird word. <laughs> like I, <laughs> it I'm is, just living life, that's all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I didn't do a burnout in front of you, did I? I probably should have. You should have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that was in town. I still have that car. I should have drove it today. Oh, yeah. yeah. I was actually kind of expecting that, but... Uh, I have oh. I have lots. I should have I should have just... I brought the Camry, because it's my... Yeah. Favorite. Believe it or not, that's one of my favorite cars in the world. So it gets amazing gas mileage, and it's efficient, and... Toyotas are the best. I know. I love them. I, I, so I've got a Toyota Matrix. I love that thing. I keep telling on people on the show, get get yourself a Toyota Matrix. It's great. Yeah, they last. They <laughs> last. They literally last forever. No, I know. The one I'm driving right now has got 260 miles. It's like 260,000. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, it's, no it's like it's just going. You know. It's... You beat me. My car out there is 250,000 miles. <laughs> Everything's original though. Same motor, transmission, like nothing. It's, and it, yeah. It's super reliable. About. Okay, so six years ago, <clears throat> this car slid on some gravel. I was taking a turn too fast, and I went straight into a ditch about a 45-degree mm-hmm. angle in. And I couldn't drive this thing out. I was actually I was pretty shocked. I was like, oh, my God, am I mm-hmm. okay? Lo and behold, my car insurance you know, paid out. They said it was totaled. I was like, no, it's not. And so I took it to a buddy. We just kind of stapled the, you mm-hmm. know, the bumper. Mm-hmm. And it's still going 100,000 miles later. <laughs> and a, no joke, uh, ended up buying my first house with, at, like, that down payment was, like, the payout on the car. Oh, perfect. Plus, it, was, it was amazing. So it's, it's, a, it's the car that keeps giving. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so good. So what's, what's the next tournament coming up? I believe it's not even until January now. I mean, we're pushed out yeah. that far. Uh, sponsors, I mean, that's how I make a living. So my sponsors, there will be some like medium-sized tournaments coming up like the end of the year, but they're not going to they're not going to pay travel. They're not going to They're basically say, you know, if you want to go fine, but they're not going to you're not going to make any money going. Even if you win, there's no money to be won. Um, and so for me, I'm just you, I'm just using this time to just kind of take a step back a little bit, focus on the games next year. Um, I'm spending a lot of family time. Yeah, uh, so that's good. I think a lot of people are too. Yeah, yeah. It, it's amazing because before I used, I mean, I every other week I was on the road, shooting tournaments, going to events and appearances and things like that. And ever since COVID happened, um, I've been literally home every single day since like March, right? And one of the things that boys say, like that's a ton of time I'm with my kids and they're not used to it. <laughs> they're like, seriously, you're here all the time, I love it. It's amazing, you know? And so I'm like, all right, so this is actually a good thing too. Well, <clears throat> I know, cause my, my girlfriend's um, five-year-old, I mean, was going to school, mm-hmm. then he wasn't going to school. Mm-hmm. Then, uh, you know, the business couldn't open back up mm-hmm. and suddenly we're all at home watching mm-hmm. TV every day. Mm-hmm. So that was an adjustment. But um, you, as I understand, have some kids. I mean, are they going to go back to school in the fall? Is I, that? I mean, I hope so. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, like, I like when they go to school because it gives me from like 8 o'clock in the morning to like 3.30 in the afternoon just like... Get something that's done. That's when I get my archery practice in. I don't... Because right now they just want to spend all their time with me and hanging out. So yeah. it kind of gives me a little bit of like, hey they're at school i can kind of get some stuff done yeah now Now, do you do you practice like in your backyard or do you have a range that you go to or how does that work yeah so i actually have an indoor range here in actual fairfield um it's 20 yards and i shoot that quite a bit uh and then you're not allowed to shoot archery in town outside not saying that i might not have maybe i have (laughs) or whatever um but most of my tournaments are 50 meters which is about 55 yards okay so I will either go to grandma and grandpa's because I live in the country and then they have a big field and I can shoot in there. Sure. Um, or um, I have a cabin in Mount Pleasant on the river. So wow. we like to like to fish a lot. So we'll go down there and I can shoot, you know, 60, 70 yards there as well. That's amazing. Now, do you hunt too? Do you I ever... do. Yeah. Really? I, st- I still hunt. Yeah. Wow. I still, I, that's how I put food on the table still. Do you really? Yeah. And so how long will a deer last you? Like, do you? It lasts me a lot now, like a lot longer now. Um, but let's say, I mean, a doe tag's 12 bucks, right? So if you already have your bow and everything, you buy this doe tag for 12 bucks and you probably get 80 to 90 pounds of hamburger. That's amazing. Which is a lot for $12. And yeah, you, and just your time, right? Well, you can't go to the store right now and buy hamburger for. T- <laughs> it's like you know, three or four dollars a pound. Yeah, yeah. So it's like you know, so that that will last me a while. But most of the time, I'll shoot, you know, three to 
sometimes eight deer a year, depending on the demand. My parents get some, my other brother gets some. and It's something I've always wanted to do, but just never got into. And I wonder, you know, uh, the meat industry took a mm. massive hit, yeah, you know, did. and you just weren't seeing things getting stocked on the shelves like they, they mm-hmm. used to. But then, you know, coming back to that self-reliance, mm-hmm. it's just it's something more primal about it mm-hmm. and you're in nature yeah. and... Um, and then you're feeding your family. Yeah. It's a beautiful so thing. I, I pride myself in, and I teach my kids that, you know, we're not just out hunting, you know, like yeah. this is for a purpose where if we do this, we eat it and, and we, you know, it. and I want them to understand that. Like it's a very blessed thing to be able to go do. So we're not out just doing stupid things. Like if, if we see an animal that we would like to harvest, and we're also going to process it and eat it. We're not going to let it go to waste. We're not going to, you know, be very smart about all that stuff because it's nature giving back to us. And then in times like right now when everybody's panicking, my freezer is still fine, right? So yeah, there's nothing wrong with being a little bit prepared prepared i guess well do you hunt other game too or is it mainly just deer i mean we're in iowa so yeah i mean it's hunting's good here uh turkeys uh-huh yeah i like turkey hunting it's one of my, it's actually one of my favorites mm. um and then fishing really i don't really hunt a lot of other things because if i if i can't eat it yeah i have no desire to, <laughs> to want to go hunt it <laughs> right <laughs> makes so, sense yeah so i would like to go elk hunting because um you get a lot of meat out of yeah. elk and I heard that their meat is really good and healthy mm. for you. Yeah. What else can we talk about? I mean, we can talk about lots of things. I want to hear about the um, your world record for hitting mm. longest target. Tell me about that. Okay. So I kind of, I kind of like, I see things all the time, and I kind of use it to motivate me. So I see this video of this guy, and he shoots a balloon at like two hundred yards. And it looks pretty impressive, and it's pretty cool. But I'm like, I could do that. So I looked up what the world record was. I'm like, oh, I'm totally going to do this world record. So 320 yards on a golf course. (laughs) Oh, my God. Yeah, we were shooting down the fairway, (laughs) like literally. In order for it to be a record, you only get three attempts in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And you have to use specific bows and equipment and things like that. And I remember before at 1130, I was going to do my shot. Yeah, for Guinness or whatever and I remember I had practiced all morning I probably shot like a hundred arrows and I only hit the target once and so <laughs> but it was windy it was like 15 mile an hour winds and I'm like this is ridiculous because I'm never going to get this record 1130 came up and I aimed and I remember shooting and the second the arrow they called it a miss but then the second I did that the wind quit <laughs> and I was like I'm going again right now I'm shooting again and I grabbed another arrow as fast as I could, and I aimed and shot, and I hit it. And then as soon as I hit, the wind picked back up again. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is incredible. Yeah. yeah. And to do that outside with the elements. I literally was aiming at an air conditioner unit at a building across the street because the target was so far away, and the angle that I had to aim at, I couldn't I, – I mean, I had to kind of – guess so it so happened that this air conditioner was like in the perfect spot so i was literally aiming at the sky at a skyscraper across the boy at, at the air conditioner unit because i imagine you're you're planning for this trajectory right mm-hmm. you know and just like the, the mm-hmm. dip or whatever and the yeah and the wind and the wind and everything it's like a so it took like three seconds from the, the time the arrow left my bow to get to the target so there's a five second delay because <laughs> Once it hits, then the guy has to see where it hits and then make the call back. So you shoot, and then you have time to eat a sandwich. <laughs> and wait, did you get it or not? Did you not get it? Yeah. Now, so when you declare you're going to do something like this, do so they like fly someone out? Or they, they must take you relatively seriously <clears throat> yeah. with your track record, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they, they got to fly in Guinness, and, and they, have, they have to bring in all these like specialists, and it has to be verified. And, and it, it's funny because since then, I, I, for some reason, it kicked off this long distance craze and so now there's some guy who supposedly they just posted a new world record or new guinness world record holder um and he did 300 and like 30 yards or something like that but i watched the video and it was him hitting a balloon well it's not official because i know you have to have an official target and you have to have a certain bow and i was like ah it's the the record (laughs) yeah what (laughs) nice (laughs) I wanted to do it to push myself, really. Like, yeah. I, I wanted to, I mean, 
I want people to know that I'm I'm trying to be the best archer in the world, not just the best para archer. Like I want to be known as the best. And the only way to be the best is you have to challenge yourself and put yourself in that position where you're competing against the best no matter who they are all the time. And I thought that this would be one of those ways to prove to the world that even though I have no arms, I can still compete with the best and, and be one of the best. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. That also seems like a moving target in that like once you hit the target, you want to hit a, a longer mm-hmm. one. What else is on the list? What's... I can tell you that I know that I have hit a target at 500 yards. Have you really? Mm-hmm. Unbelievable. Yeah. It took me 17 shots. So obviously it's not a word record, but you I know, it's there. I know that it's there yeah. and, and we could totally make a video. You don't have to show the 17 that I missed. You can show the one that I hit if you wanted to, but, and it'd be like an unofficial record, but I know the capabilities of the bow and I know what it's capable of. In fact, I feel like I could probably even get to about 800 yards if I did it correctly, like get up on a mountain and then shoot down a hill. <laughs> I want to see that. But it would be so cool. <laughs> It'd be so cool. Yeah. I, if you, you set that one up. Let me know. I'll, I'll help you record it. Okay. <laughs> I'm, look, I have so many ideas in my head about just... So here's, here's how my brain works. If you look at the, the top athletes in the world and in their perspective sport and who's the best, it's not, it's not just the guy who scores the most points. It's, also, it's the guy who makes the sport better it's the guy who pushes the sport to its limit and pushes people to be better too Mm. that's how you know they're the best art or or the best person in their field michael phelps didn't win everything but he's also the best swimmer in the world because he made the sport what it is so when i'm thinking about how do i become the best archer i'm not just trying to win everything i'm also trying to make sport the sport better itself so in my brain i'm always trying to do things that no one's ever done before so literally i'm driving to utah and there's, I go through the, the Interstate 80 or whatever, and there's there's a big mountain on one side and a big mountain on the other side. And I was like, I should put a target over here, and I should sit over here and shoot across the interstate and try to hit the target <laughs> over there. Like, that's where my mind goes, because no one's done that. And everybody would be like, wow, you know, mind blown. And then it just helps push archery and make it better, right? So that's kind of like I'm always, <laughs> I, have, <laughs> I have so many crazy ideas. I, you need, I, I think you need a YouTube channel at the very least. Something. I know, I know. You, this stuff's got to get out there. I'm good at being creative with content and and then i i'm not very good at the editing or actually launching it so if i had somebody who could do all that side of this stuff or i'll give you content for days yeah <laughs> well sign me up i'd love to help that sounds fun actually when i so when i was younger i rode a bull and so was I, that terrifying i, I got a con- i'll tell you the story all right okay <laughs> before i tell before i tell the story I think a YouTube channel of me doing creative stuff like that would be awesome. Kind of almost like dirty jobs, right? Uh, but it's not dirty jobs. It's me traveling around the world trying to do sports or things that people wouldn't think I could do. Whether it's frisbee golf or riding a bull or taking a truck and, and setting the world record for the fastest someone's ever pulled a camper. Whatever it is, right? <laughs> like, I want to do that stuff. And I think it would be entertaining, and I think people would watch it. Anyway, when I was younger, I wanted to be a professional bull rider. And I remember, I think I was probably 12, and we had, we had cows and bulls on our farm because I grew up on a farm. Cows, chickens, pigs, snakes, everything. And <laughs> I remember waking up one morning, and I told my younger brother that, hey, today's the day I become the best bull rider in the world. I'm going to start my journey. I'm going to need your help. So we have this bull. He's probably 800 pounds. I mean, he's still young, but we call him Billy. And Billy was very, like, he was used to me because I would always have to feed the, the cows every evening. And I would, you know, so so my brother came out. And, I, and I, I mean, I was playing the part. I was wearing jeans and a flannel shirt and I had a cowboy <laughs> hat on. You know, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do this. <laughs> so I go out to, the, out to the pasture and we get Billy and it's like noon or whatever. And I put the bucket down by the fence and he's eating. So then I climb up the fence and I get on the back of him. And as I'm sitting there, and my brother was there, as I'm sitting there, this thought goes through my mind, like, how am I going to hold on? But I'm already on him because I was so excited about riding, but and he was just eating, like he didn't care that I was on him. So my brother was like, hey, in the, in, on TV, when you watch rodeos, they tie ropes around their bellies. So like we, I got back down, we got a rope, we tied it around his belly, and I climbed back on. 
And as I'm sitting on there, I'm thinking like, how am I going to hold on? Like, should I use my foot? Should I use my teeth? Like, I'm not for sure. And my brother goes, I got this great idea. Let's tie your long sleeve shirt, the sleeve. Let's tie that sleeve to the rope. Oh that's tied God. around this bowl and I, in my mind i'm like oh this is a good idea this like i'm never great. gonna fall yeah. off this is gonna be amazing <laughs> for some reason in my brain i thought like that was like my arm and i was gonna hold on so he double he okay so he knots it and i'm like double knot it that way i don't fall off like i was like very like make sure you tie it tight oh, God. so now I'm, I'm tied to this rope and i remember getting ready to my the plan was for my brother was to take away the um the feed or whatever and then maybe it would make him like walk off or whatever so i'm getting ready to tell my brother i'm tied in i'm ready to go and i see my dad at this point now he's he's running out of the house apparently he must have seen what i was doing and my dad's always let me do everything and, and kind of learn on my own so as he's running towards me i got this feeling like maybe this is one of those moments where he's going to probably tell me this is really stupid so as I'm rethinking this whole scenario, I hear a noise and it's, uh, it goes like this. So on a farm, my brother thought it'd be funny to take the, it's a cattle prod, the electric oh, cattle prod. Right. And he thought it would be funny to, to zap Billy in the rump with it. And we take off across this field. Like Billy just like takes off running with me on it. And I'm just like, the first thing that went was my hat. And then I remember waking up on the ground. Oh and and I was like laying there and my brother's laughing. And my dad, I don't, my dad's yelling at something. I don't know exactly what's all being said because I'm a little groggy. And I remember that my back was itchy. So I looked down and I wasn't wearing a shirt. And so I sit up and Billy is still running around the pasture and my shirt is still tied to the rope and it's flapping like in oh the in the wind. And what, what saved me was that it was a button up shirt. So when I went flying, the buttons all popped off. And then I, I let... <laughs> That's terrifying. <laughs> yeah, but I was like, I wanted, to be the, I wanted to be the best so bad that I like, I didn't think it through. I was just doing it. And yeah. hindsight obviously is like, hey, maybe I shouldn't do that. And so how did that, I mean, were you more determined then or, or did you get a, a reality check? Hey, maybe I don't want to do this. Or <laughs> I, I, I learned really quickly that, you know, bull riding wasn't for me. Mm. I still secretly wanted to be a bull rider, but I, I think in that part of my brain was like, if you're going to do that, you have to think it through now. Mm. You can't just jump on things and go full. That, that's kind of like my MO. I'm like, I get ideas and I just go with it. Yeah. And... That, that probably wasn't smart. I probably could have got hurt pretty bad. I remember no one, no, I never, my dad never yelled at me. He never lectured me. He never said, what were you thinking? Um, you know, I never heard anything about any of it from anyone and which, which was kind of cool because yeah. I think he knew I learned a little bit that I need to be a little bit smarter about my choices. The next day I was like, Hey, I'm going to be a basketball player. So I started playing basketball. I was going to be the next Michael Jordan. Wow. Yeah. There's something about, you know, everyone when they're growing up, you want to test boundaries. You want to figure out, like, mm. you know, what you're made of. Mm -hmm. I mean, you were just trying to test the boundaries here, right? I mean, you were, you wanted to know what your limitations were. My, my mom and dad were probably the best parents in the world. And I'll tell you why. Well, I'm a, I was adopted at 13 months old. Mm. And when they adopted me, they were wanting to adopt, but they didn't want to adopt somebody with a physical disability or a mental disability. But they said they walked into the room and I jumped up and ran to them. And I it was like, I knew that they were my parents. So they're like, oh, we got to take them home. And they took me home for a week and then decided to keep me. So that right there, because they didn't want to, then they decided to. Now, what's amazing about my parents is that at a very young age, they decided to let me learn on my own. Like, okay, Tie my shoes, right? They'll show me how to tie my shoes, but then I have to tie my shoes on my own. Like, we showed you how, you know, like, unless it's an emergency situation, we want you to learn how to do things on your own because they decided to teach me how to adapt myself to the world instead of adapting the world to me. Because everybody was like, well, you're going to need all this stuff in your house, special doors, you're going to need faucets you're going to need somebody to take care of this kid all the time and, and they didn't want that to be that way they wanted me to learn so they i did a lot of things like climbing trees and falling and and they let me do that like driving you know they 
let me get in a car and just say, okay, here you go, figure it out, you know? And so I drove around the pasture and figured it out. And that's, yeah, incredible. I mean, like they were very yeah. open-minded about letting me try things and failing because that was about the only way we were going to learn. Mm. And, and what it turned into was a guy who couldn't get a job sitting on the couch, deciding to try archery and leading to where I am now. If they would have catered to me this entire time, I wouldn't be here. I, my mindset would be completely different. So now in my mind, because of them, I think I can literally do anything. I jump out of planes, and, you <laughs> know, like, you. like I, I feel like there's nothing I can't do. In fact, the only thing I can't do is if someone tells me I can't do it, like, yeah. like legally. So uh, I was in Vegas and I love cars. I love racing and going fast. And I wanted to rent, um, uh, it was like 150 bucks and you get to take a Ferrari around a racetrack and I wanted to do it. And they said, no, you can't. You have no arms. You can't do that. I'm like, yeah, but I have a legal driver's license. I rent cars all the time. Like, I've been over 200 miles an hour in, other, in my own car. So, like, I don't know why I can't, like, and I even show them videos. And they're like, no, we can't. We can't let you. You can't do that. You have no arms. That bugs me, right? But that's the only time I can't do something. <laughs> Not because I can't physically do something. Because yeah. I, I can do it just fine. <clears throat> yeah, speaking of excellent parents, I mean, it's got to be so hard when you love someone mm -hmm. and you don't want them to suffer mm -hmm. in this world you know mm -hmm. and it seems like the loving thing to do would be to like hold the bowl mm -hmm. hold the door you know yeah. whatever that's all well and good but teaching someone to fish as opposed to, you know mm -hmm. yeah it's pretty cool because if if you were to say, invite you in, into my house right now this is my house these are my cars besides a picture on the wall there's nothing in that house that would make you believe that there's a guy with that arms that lives there that's incredible. There, it's a little, like, even my cars are all completely normal. Yeah. There's nothing modified, I mean, besides engines and going faster. But as far <laughs> as, there's no crazy steering wheels, there's no nothing. Like, I could drive your car, you could drive my cars. And you were telling me you, you build your cars, right? Yeah, yeah I, I do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, how did you pick that up? I mean, it seems like you do everything. What, what don't you do? Yeah, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> At one point in my life, I wanted to be a race car driver. I, I wanted to be a lot of things. At a young age, I knew I was I was destined to be sports and, and into stuff like that. So I tried lots of things uh, until I found an archery, right? Um, I don't know if there's really anything I can't do, though. Uh, cars have always been... It, it's very similar to archery, and I'll tell you why. Archery doesn't care if you have arms or not. I have no arms, and that bow does not care that I use my feet to shoot it to beat somebody to provide for my family. It does not care. Neither does the target. No one cares. It's just like a car. A car does not care who drives it. Mm. It's still going to perform exactly the same for me as it would with somebody with hands. And I think because it's that way, I'm able to express myself and be myself and do it, you know, and, I, and it doesn't care. And that's why I fell in love with cars. That's why I build cars and it lets me do what I want. It lets me be met. I, I do want to ask the question again. Is there something that you haven't done that, that you want to do that's on the <laughs> list? <What? laughs> yeah, yeah. Believe it or not, I want to set the world record for the fastest somebody has towed a camper. Wow. It's a legit world record. <laughs> yeah. That is so specific. Yeah. How did you arrive at that one? Um, I one day was sitting at home and, and I love to go fast. And um, I saw some guy, they were, it was a, they literally have races where they hook these cars to like really junky campers and then they do like figure eight races with your camper. <laughs> like it's, it's totally redneck. That's awesome. But it looks so awesome and fun. <laughs> and, I, and I was like watching them do that and I was like, I wonder what's the fastest anybody has towed something. So I went online and I, like 10 years ago, somebody hooked a camper to a truck and went like 100 miles an hour. And I was like, wow, that's fast. I'm like, I want to do that. I want to pull a camper like 150 miles an hour if possible. Like I just, <laughs> I just want to like, you know, and, and I've always, I've been wanting to do that for a long time. Cool. Um, I keep getting shut down from, with my agent, you know, my agent Scott, he keeps turning <laughs> me down because he says it's dangerous. And yeah, of course it's dangerous. But, and then he's like, well, you have games next year and we really need you to go to the games. I'm like, yeah, I want to go to the games too. So it's always been pushed off and pushed off and pushed <laughs> off. And then I always tell myself after the games and I'll do that record. 
That's it so cool. It hasn't happened yet, but it, it will. All right, point. so for a motorhead like yourself, have you ever ridden in any of those Tesla vehicles? Yes. Really? Yeah. See, I haven't. Tell really? me about it. Yeah. Okay. I, they have like ludicrous <clears throat> mode, right? Yeah. So it, it's <laughs> insane. So um, one of my friends, uh, he owns Easton mm. products. So okay. You, I'm you, not familiar, I, and it, I should be. Apologize. Internet. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> like baseball, East, they have like the baseball bats, the hockey sticks, okay, Easton, sure. like sporting equipment. Okay. And um, at the time, I had just finished building a, a BMW M6 with the V10, right? So it was really fast and mm. logical. And I was showing it to him, and because he has a Porsche something, I don't even remember what he had at the time. And I, but I was getting him off the line and stuff like that. And so the next day. He shows up with this like SUV Tesla. I don't even remember exactly what it was, but it's like this big, huge SUV. <laughs> and he's like, "Let's re let's race again." I'm like, <laughs> "Okay, you know, your electric car." <laughs> and he stomped me in oh this like God. five thousand pound, and I'm in this little like three thousand pound. And he just like when we launched, he's like gone. I was like, "What?" <laughs> so like I got to ride in it. And he turned on this crazy mode on this screen, and it just flew. I'm like, "What?" In the world? And, and then I was sold. I was like, Teslas are no joke, amazing machines. And I was, uh, Alex wants me to get one so bad. But, I want to get one, but yeah. Well, okay, so it's not practical here per se, because there's not a lot of charging stations really, you yeah. know, like in bigger cities, they have those charging stations everywhere and you yeah. can drive a long time. I mean, I still see Teslas around here, but if they were to break, there's no Tesla dealership. So then you got to like fly to Chicago to get it fixed. Yeah. If I knew more about them and could fix them myself, I would totally try to figure out how to buy one because they're amazing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's cool. Yeah. So how many vehicles do you own? Do you I've been, I've been down, them? I've been downgrading, but I'm, I got like seven right now. Seven. Yeah. Oh, sweet. Yeah. And what's your favorite one? Oh, it's so hard. Ironically enough, it's a, it's my, it's my camera. <laughs> Is it your camera? <laughs> yes. Yes. You heard it here. You heard it here. I actually have two Camrys. I'm going to turn this down just slightly. I, I get so excited that sometimes I don't watch the levels. And <laughs> make sure we're not blowing out here. So, uh, 2019 Dodge Hemi, uh, 1980 purple Camaro. I called Jenny because I put a big engine in it. You call it Jenny? I call my car Jenny. Do you really? Yeah. F from Forrest Gump. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously? Why? Okay, Are wait. you kidding me? No, really. I do. I name my cars. <laughs> this isn't a prank. No, this is like legit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to tell you why I call it Jenny, and okay. then you tell me why you call it Jenny, okay? Oh, my God. Yeah. I call it Jenny because when I was, when the engine I wanted to put in there, people said, that's too big, it won't fit. Mm. And it literally was the most pain in the rear thing I've done. It, it gave me so many problems <laughs> and was always, like, stressing problems, me out. Stress. And just problems and stress. <laughs> but I fell in love, and, and then and now it's, like, amazing and perfect and it still breaks occasionally because it has like lots of power and little things break on it. And it, so it still has that like, it just reminded me of, I love you, Jenny. You know, like, and I'm <laughs> yeah, just like, Jenny, yeah. like, ah, I love you so much, but you keep running off. But I still love you. And every, you know, like, <laughs> you just, you create that connection. That's how I, that's how I came up with Jenny. Yeah, I, I think of her and she's just got this like wild yeah. life journey. Sure. Um, she went into a ditch. And yeah. buy you a house. Yeah, no, I know. It's crazy. It's like she left me and then she came back. I don't know. It's like you love something, let it go. And then it's, yeah. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Mm. That movie is so freaking good. Yeah, it, it's really good. I then have uh, a car. It's an 05 Infinity G35 mm. Coupe, which is uh, a really small sports car that I put the new Corvette engine in. Whoa. I call it the unicorn because it's like the only <laughs> one in the world that's like that. <laughs> yeah, it, it's really fast and does amazing things. It actually was featured in Ripley's, um, me doing drifts with it in, really? in Ripley's. Yeah. Well, so you've been on TV a, a number of times, right? Yeah, actually, I just got done filming um, a show called To Tell the Truth with uh, Anthony Anderson. Wow. Yeah. That was, How did that, that go? Good time. It, went, it went good. Um, what was the format of the show? So basically what they do is they have a row of, of celebrities, panelists, and then they introduce three guests, and one of them um, has to tell the truth, and the other two can lie about the profession, and it's the celebrity's job to figure out who is the real person. <laughs> so they, they basically, it was me, and then there was a girl with a robot arm, and then there was a visually impaired lady. I was the real person. They were trying to figure out who was the champion archer. 
No way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then they get to ask you questions. I always had to tell the truth. And those, the girls that were, they could lie all they want to. <laughs> but I sat with them for probably four hours. And I told them, like, they were very good actors because they remembered all the archery facts. So when somebody was like, how heavy is your bow? They'd be like, well, I draw 45 pounds. Like, and it was, they did really good and they nailed it. Like, the whole point was to try to confuse the, <laughs> the judges as much as possible. Wow. Yeah. And Wait, so then multiple people guessing or? Yeah, there's like, there's four people and they're all trying to guess who the real person is. Did anyone guess right? <sighs> yeah, they figured me out. They figured yeah, you out. Yeah, which is weird because. What gave it away? I Look, I, <laughs> I, I have my own. <laughs> I've done a lot of, I actually have a lot of viral videos and it was, I, I feel like I've, I've did, like I've been on the cover of um, a lot of book or not books, but like magazines and shows and I've been on TV shows and late night shows and all that kind of stuff. I feel like they kind of knew because they didn't ask me a lot of questions. They asked the other two people a lot of questions, but then they still chose me. Mm. So I feel like they kind of already knew. They've seen somewhere, somewhere at some point in their life they saw me on wall street journal or they saw me somewhere they knew i'm the only one in the world really that has norms and shoots a boat right yeah so it's you're like, a little too high profile y- yeah maybe. so i think they already <laughs> knew one of the actors said we knew i knew it was you because you were probably the least likely person to shoot a boat and we felt like the producer were just trying to throw us off like you were too good like it was still a blast. It was, still, it, was. it was still so much I'd fun. I'd like to see it. So it already it's aired, right? It aired right. live two weeks ago, but you can actually go back now and watch the rerun of it. Cool. I was also on the show with the guy who created the cha-cha slide. Oh. Yeah, I don't know if you ever heard it. It's like a famous uh, step to oh, yeah. the left, step to the right. Or... Two hops. Yeah, time. two hops. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah whatever that song. Yeah, he was on the show there, too. So, wow. Yeah. That's cool. Hey, so how does this show compare to like other late night shows? The one I'm on right now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> I actually feel more down to earth here. Mm. Yeah, I feel it's way just more relaxed. You know, oh, I can just be, my, it can be myself, yeah. That's that's a real goal of the show. I, you, you're I, doing a good job. Thank you. I, um, I was seeing my friends. I was scrolling through Facebook over the last several months, and it was a real, real impetus to start this show because I, I recognize, I felt like people weren't having the kind of conversations that I wanted to see. And a lot, a lot of my friends, people I know in the community, I wanted to, I wanted to have this kind of dialogue Mm -hmm. with them. So, uh, I got to a tipping point over the whole COVID thing. I'm just like, I've had it. We're doing it. Time's (laughs) up. No more excuses. Um, and uh does that mean i'm gonna see you like high profile like joe rogan almost i hope so yeah i'm actually see i'm modeling the show after him i I listen to his shows almost daily Mm. yeah there seems to be a real demand for that i don't know what it is long format interview style Mm -hmm. uh you know we have smartphones so if i'm like you know i've got a garden in the backyard i'll be weeding it i'll just throw on a podcast or Mm -hmm. you know like I, i do a lot of various construction type stuff as well fixing up things on my house and uh yeah it's like three hours a day no problem mm-hmm. for me i just fit it in i i love I, I listen to a lot of a lot of guys but at some point i was like i want to do that um i'm glad you're doing it oh thank you yeah and i'm just getting started right so like you said your agent got in touch with me i was like oh my god this guy's <laughs> from chicago what <laughs> like we need to like amend the contract <laughs> like and you know it's like i yeah. want to be able to say well let me run but that by my lawyer but you know guess yeah what? It, it's all good I, <laughs> it's it's all good it, no. it throws it off sometimes when i say hey my agent's gonna get in touch with you no it's funny. awesome and honestly it really uh like i said local I, local's good good stuff I, I like really i good. like local stuff because um they treat me well and i would like to give back a little bit it's your hometown man it's It's like yeah you gotta just you gotta (laughs) you gotta support hometown people yeah whatever their dreams are too you gotta you gotta help out if you can that's a beautiful thing yeah Yeah. have you ever thought about relocating what what's Hmm. inspired you to stay in fairfield as long as you have i I mean honestly i kind of want to move to utah um i lived in utah for a year right before the rio games and the family and we all moved out there and I wanted to move out there this year, uh, and because one of my sponsors it's the, it has a, a seven million dollar archery range. I mean, it's like has all the best technology in the world there, and uh, I get to train there for free and utilize everything. And so, especially 
getting close to the games because I'll, so like right now in Iowa, if I want to practice, I practice by myself. There's nobody to push me. It's just me in my yard for hours and hours. There's nobody in there might be like one or two archers in Iowa that you know are good that can come and shoot with me and stuff. But if I go there every day, there's ten or twelve archers. Yeah. So if we're all training together, it makes me better too because I'm shooting with them on a daily basis at that point. So I wanted to move to Utah and you know get a full year of training before the games start again because it it definitely made me better um but then everything happens so. <laughs> i i like i like fairfield better than utah as in the aspect of community and stuff like that yeah but utah just has a better for what i do it's a better training center so yeah in an ideal world if i could have that here then it, obviously you would never leave oh I, w I meant to ask you this earlier but when you practice i mean what what is that you got a thousand arrows or what is it i mean it's, yeah yeah no, is it I, really I, like that yeah i did the math one time <laughs> And I think I shoot, you know, like two to three hundred thousand arrows a year, oh <laughs> which is a lot. Which is a lot. It's a lot. It's yeah. a lot. Um, but a lot of times, uh, you know, I'll shoot three to three to six hours a day, maybe even more, depending on what I'm working on. Mm. Uh, I'll shoot six arrows and I'll walk and get them, and then I'll come back and sit down and I'll shoot six more. And so the six, the same six arrows will last me all day, every, you know, all day. I don't. Yeah, I don't. Have, you know, they don't. They're tough now. If you think of arrows, the technology in arrows. I mean, I have arrows that are ten years old that still hit bullseyes. And and so, what's that process like for you? Is that just like a, a really meditative state, or are you thrown on Mozart? Or are you listening to hard rock? What is it? Yeah. So I've, I okay. This is this is kind of something else we have in common. I've experimented with music and playing things while I'm practicing and things like that. Um, Heavy metal, uh, not heavy metal, ACDC, Guns N' Roses, Motley Crue. Mm. I like that. I like all music. But I'll, I'll play them. And then it's weird because if I, um, I, I also like listening to podcasts and stuff. <laughs> so, What well, are some of your favorites? Well, it's called Donut Media. Uh, okay. It's legit just, just stupid car stuff. But it's, it's the history of cars. So like you could go on there right now. And in a very entertaining way, a guy will tell you the history of the Toyota Camry and how it became so amazing, right? So what's the history of it? But he's very energetic, mm. and there's anim you know, it's like he makes you want to listen because it's he came up with like that means more horsepower, baby, <laughs> or like, I and mean, he's always doing crazy <laughs> stuff, right? So I, I, he has the you know, thousands and thousands of podcasts and videos yeah. and stuff like that. So I'll listen to him uh, versus country. So. Motley Crue, I'll look at my score, and then I'll then I'll play like a country, like all country, or it's just more mellow. And I'll look at my score and in in podcasts, I feel like my score is better with podcasts and slower music because when you hmm. have like kind of rock, rock going on, you get a little energized. Well, then I don't know why I just don't. <laughs> but, it's just not conducive but it's for not firing so, well because yeah because you're trying to it's almost like a meditation <clears throat> state where you're you're very zenning and trying to. I remember um, at a tournament one time, when you get to the finals, they only give you 20 seconds to shoot an arrow. And my 20 seconds started, and I remember aiming at the target. And because of the time, someone stands behind me, and it's their job to tell me what, how much time we have left. Because if you don't shoot the arrow in 20 seconds, you get a zero. Mm. And you can't afford a zero, because the zeros are pretty much automatic out. You never recoup from that. So I remember aiming my bow, and I remember getting the 10-second warning, and then... And then the wind blew me off target, and then I get a five-second warning. Uh, at, so I get the 10-second warning, and then at five, they go five, four, three, and they actually count down. I can hear them. So I hear the 10-second warning, then I get blown off target. By the time I get back on target, I hear them go five, four, but then I don't hear three. And I'm like, what is going on? Like, And I, start, I actually start thinking to myself, like, how come he quit counting? Is there something wrong with the timer? And then I was like, well, should I look at the timer and, like, did something happen? And I start thinking all these things for like a minute. I just like, should I look at the clock and figure out how much time I have left? And then if I if I do that, then I uh, I got to refocus all my energy at aiming and all the mental things I go through. And I thought that basically, in the amount of time I just told you that, the same amount of time I thought that, then I heard him say three. For some reason, that whole 30 seconds I just talked to you was only a second in real life. But I was able to, for some reason calculate and think about all that stuff and it seemed like i was talking or thinking for like a minute 
you know i was like what in the world and then i shot and you know hit a bullseye whatever but (laughs) no big deal (laughs) yeah but but, i mean it's very zen for sure like it's very if i put on you know something that i'm listening to like a podcast let's say i put on your podcast to shoot um let's say for example tomorrow those six hours might go like really fast i'm not overthinking things i'm letting my brain and body just do what they know they were supposed to do i'm yeah, and time flies, you know, it's just... It does. Yeah, just poofed. <laughs> <laughs> so you could do this for the rest of your life. I mean, in, right? in, in theory, there's there's guys who are, you know, in their 50s that are still winning money. Really? Yeah. Cool. So and... the shelf life of an archer is really good. You know, there there's archers who are 18 years old right now, and, and they're, beca- they're one of the best right now. They're people you got to watch out for. Well, if they continue this, I mean, they could do this until... You know, there's guys right now that are 70 and shooting in the senior division and still winning money, right? So what but usually goes... Maybe that'll be you. May, maybe. I, you know, I thought about that, but I, lo- I, I love archery a lot, but there's so many other things I want to do, you know? like Life is pretty short. Life is I pretty mean, short, you yeah. know? Like, I've already... I'm, what, 10 years into it now, and I would like to at least continue my... my my plan pretty much is I'll always shoot archery and go to, like, local tournaments or something like that. But maybe after the the games um, when it's in L.A. So that would be 20, 2028, I think, because it's every mm-hmm. four years. So 2024 is Paris. So four more years later, it be 2028. Yeah, so in, okay. in 2028, yeah. it's going to be in California. If I can stay on my game until then, then that will be the time after that games to just... And then... Because that, that's eight more years. I'm 37. So that gives me still lots of time to do other things. and Do the professional race yeah, car driving. Yeah, I, I still want to. I still I still want to do that. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, cool. I'll probably never get to a professional level, but I can still do local levels. Um, I wonder what advice you might have uh, for the young people coming up today. Something that might give them that extra push or boost some inspiration you gotta you can't give up on your dreams no matter Mm -hmm. how difficult it is when i was younger i wanted to be a professional baseball player or a basketball player i wanted to be a race car driver i want to be a bull rider i want to be a bmx racer like those are things i remember i wanted to be and at the top of my game at when i grew up i'm an archer a professional archer and in and it i didn't find it until you know 10 years ago or whatever by accident by accident but i'm still living the same dream right so all those other sports that i wanted to do why did i want to do them what make in i still have the same feeling and satisfaction because i wanted to do it to provide i'm still getting that same satisfaction even though it's a different sport but if i would have quit looking after all those times i realized i wasn't going to be able to do professional basketball player or race car driver things like that then i would never be here now so I never gave up on my dream. I kept looking and looking and looking. And like, if you if you love it and that's what you know you want to do, you can't let people tell you no. Like, you just gotta you gotta push and you gotta do it. And even if you fail, guess what? Get up the next day and try again, because eventually it'll happen, and you'll be super happy with yourself that you didn't quit. You'll eventually hit that bullseye. Eventually hit the bullseye. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You might find it earlier in life. You might find it later in life. But the second you quit, it's not going to be good. Never, never quit. I never quit. Yeah, I yeah. don't. I don't like to quit. I no, that's boring. No. In fact, when you know when someone says you can't do it, you just want to do it more. You know? Exactly. Yeah, that's the <laughs> quickest way to get me to do something. But you can't do that. It's like, hey, thanks. I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually starting to take it as a compliment nowadays i yeah i was trying to start the podcast a couple of people said i was crazy and i shouldn't be doing this right now but i just thought what else am i gonna do yeah yeah you know people who don't have the same vision and you talk to them about it always thinks it's crazy Mm. i remember when i said i was going to become an archer and there was people that say you can't even shoot a bow you have no arms and then i did that then it turned into well you're never actually going to be good and they started getting good. And they're like, well, you're never going to win anything. And I started winning things. And now no one says nothing. You know, so there's always those people. And and all the people who talk like that are people who aren't doing anything. Like, not saying negative Nancy's or anything, but mm. those are the people who want to be doing want to be doing stuff, yeah. but don't do yeah. it for some reason. They could be doing it if they wouldn't have to work at it. So, I don't know. You just, you just got to, like, do your thing and... 
Yeah, you'll be okay. That's believe awesome. believe in what you do. Yeah. Well, thanks for being such a living testament of that. Mm-hmm. Truly, I I learned a lot from you today. Thanks. I'm I can't wait to watch you compete. <laughs> I I hope it's sooner want, rather than later. I want to compete. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you know, uh, assuming the COVID thing blows over and it'll eventually get better. I know yeah. the cases in Iowa are going up right now or whatever, yeah. but it's not going to shut the whole world down forever, no. right? So it will come back. Things will be fine. We just have to be patient. It's kind of like, you know, with your podcast and stuff, you just got to be patient and eventually you'll get to the point that you want to be at. You just got to, we just got to let it blow over. We got to continue living every day like we want to. That's so good. Yeah. Hey, so how do people find you if they want to see your stuff, learn mm-hmm. more about you? I have an Instagram account, I think, or no, a Twitter. I have a Twitter, but I never, the last time I posted was like two years ago. I, I'm the guy who likes to be outside doing stuff versus always on social media. But I do have a good Facebook following under The Armless Archer. Um, I post lots of stuff usually on there, car-related, archery-related. Anything that I think is cool that I'm doing, I'm posting about. All right. I'll check it out when we get done with this podcast. But thanks so much for being on the podcast, Matt. I really appreciate it. No, no problem. Thank you very much for having me. All right. This is me waving. (laughs) There it is. Bye, everybody.